the Jordan 11 is one of the most popular Jordans ever, and it might be the coolest Jordan that we've ever cut apart. Going into this thing, I didn't expect much from it. I was like, oh, I'll just cut apart another Jordan. But this thing is interesting. It has a lot of really cool technology in it. And uh, so we're gonna cut it apart and show you all the different things and, and really put these materials to the test. Because a lot of, there's a lot of things inside the shoe that I bet you didn't know. And there's a lot of claims about the materials of this test, or the materials of this shoe, that uh, we'll see if they're actually true or not. This video is sponsored by StockX. StockX, if you don't know, is a live global marketplace that sells new and authentic products. And you probably heard me talk about StockX because we've, they've done some videos with us and we buy a lot of the shoes from StockX because they're so easy to use and because they have so much data behind their products. So I wanted to walk you through the, the process of buying on StockX so you can get an idea of how easy it actually is. So first thing you do is search for the product you actually wanna buy. And StockX shows you all the different colorways and styles and some associated products as well. From there, you just click on the shoe and check the price differences and all the different sizes they have. And what's really cool is you can also see the price trends on the bottom of the screen. So if it's trending up or it's trending down, you kind of know where you sit in the market and maybe when the best time to buy is. They also put all the product information below and you can see the original price, the details, and all the, the information they could gather about the shoes. And you also have a couple of choices on how to buy. You can hit the buy now button option or place a bid to see if the seller takes your offer. And once you've purchased your item, the seller sends the product to StockX who verifies that it's brand new and authentic. And we bought a pair of shoes recently that actually got rejected by their authentication process and we got a full refund and it was super easy and we didn't end up getting fake shoes. And that's why I like StockX, it's really simple to use, it has a lot of awesome features, you can trust it, the pricing data, the occasional raffle, the win cool stuff, the below retail section. So check it out, it's a really great way to get those hard to find items. And I'll link the shoes from this video with the link in the description and also I'll link a few things I think you guys might like that you didn't know was on StockX. So check them out below and thanks again to StockX. So the quick history of the Jordan 11, well in 1993, October 6, Michael Jordan retires. He's no longer professional basketball players after 10 years in the league. Then Michael Jordan tried a new sport, went and played some baseball for a little while. And while Jordan was playing baseball, they still released the Jordan 9, that which Michael Jordan didn't even play in, which I think hurt the cells. 94, they released the Jordan 10. Apparently Michael Jordan did not approve of and was meant to be the final Jordan shoe because Nike had plans to completely discontinue the Jordan line and retire after the Jordan 10. But world famous Tinker Hatfield had other ideas. So he still was designing the Jordan, the next Jordan iteration behind the scenes just in case he came back. But in 1995, Michael Jordan did decide to come back and play basketball with his famous I am back statement and change his number to 45 and debuted the Air Jordan 11 and then went on to play 17 games in the shoe in the last bit of the 94 -90 season which in the playoffs he got fined like five thousand dollars for wearing the wrong color which is kind of crazy and then in 96 they won the championship and then also in November of 96 so maybe the place that I first saw the Jordan 11s was in Space Jam they released the colorway it was, he's, it was a sneaker he wore during the Space Jam filming and I think that's part of why they're so popular, but also there's a lot of materials in the shoe that I think really made it popular. But it is a really interesting backstory of the shoe because it was right at the hype of like the, the most interesting aspects of Jordan's career to a lot of people. And it coincided with the release of Space Jam. And it's just always been one of the most popular Jordans of all time. So now let's dig into the materials and see if this shoe actually lives up to the hype, starting with the leather first. And the one thing that really sticks out to people about this shoe is the patent leather. So what is patent leather? Well, it was invented in 1818, and, and, it, and technically it was a little bit before, but really popularized in 1818, where they took regular leather and just coated it with lacquer and linseed oil with over and over and over again. It was a super labor intensive process because back then they didn't have plastics to put on top of leather. So, so they had to do it in tons of layers and in between the layers, they had to sand it down with pumice to get the next layer to grip. And I'm all while trying to maintain a good shine so that as you build up those layers, you don't have cloudy layers in between. So at the time in the early 1800s, all the way up to early 1900s, patent leather was the best of the best. There's like cordovan, there's patent leather, and then there was everything else. And it wasn't just about the looks. It also was a fairly waterproof leather because that heavy coating on top it didn't it didn't crease and fold as easily and it was really easy to clean up you, like if you wore it out on the streets all you have to do is go home and wipe it off with a wet towel and they're as good as new you don't have to spend 20 minutes shining them and that's why patent leather was so famous and so expensive at the time but now fast forward 200 years later what, what do we have for patent leather well it's a completely different leather and it's shouldn't even technically be called patent leather because all it is is a regular leather with a really heavy coating of plastic on top that has a really heavy sheen on it. So 
it's still technically patent leather, but it's a completely different process and all the heritage of what made patent leather patent leather is no longer really around today. And I'm not even sure if anyone actually makes patent leather in the same traditional way that they used to. And one little interesting fact is I've always wondered, even before this video, I was wondering where the name patent leather came from. But doing the research for this video, I found that the, one of the original inventors of patent leather actually got a real patent on it to protect the rights to it. And that's why it got named patent leather, because it was just patented. I thought there was a way more interesting backstory to it, but it was just a patented technique. So what about this patent leather on the Jordan 11s? How does it hold up? What is it made of? Well, this leather, if we put it to a few different tests, if we do a little cross section look at it, we get really close in the macro, you can see how thick this layer is. It's significantly thicker than most of the coatings we see on Nike leather. Even the really cheap leather has a really heavy plastic coating on top. This shiny patent coating is even thicker than that. So then we put it to the flame to see how it reacted to see if it really was a plastic coating and it just melted and sizzled in it. It was surprising how long it actually took to get to the leather itself, but clearly it's a synthetic coating on top. And then we took a quick measurement of the leather and it's 1.8 millimeters thick. So it's a little bit thicker than most of the leathers you see on Nike. It's a little bit closer to like the SB and the more purpose built shoes because most Nike leathers are around like 1.2 to 1.4 millimeters thick. So maybe the base leather itself is about the same thickness as the rest, but that really heavy coating gives it just a little bit more thickness. So what was the purpose in putting patent leather on this shoe other than the, allegedly it was supposed to look like a convertible sports car. Well, Tinker Hatfield said that Jordan had this issue where he was such a great athlete that he'd almost play out of his shoes and his foot would slop around in the inside of the shoe, causing the side of the shoe to bulge out and his foot to actually go over the side of the midsole. So when they were designing the shoe, they wanted to have a durable, good looking leather that didn't have a lot of stretch to stop his foot from blowing out the shoe. And with that heavy layer on patent leather, it helps it prevent it from stretching because it's a structural layer on top, almost like a double layer of that grain pattern that gives leather all of its strength. But is that actually true? So we wanted to test that by seeing how much we could actually stretch this leather compared to the other leathers. And as you can see, it does actually have some stretch resistance compared to a lot of the other leathers. And especially where Jordan liked that tumbled leather because it didn't have a break-in period, tumbled leather is really stretchy. So it seems like it does add some benefit to the shoe. And speaking of the flexibility, that you know, they couldn't do this whole shoe in patent leather because Jordan would have hated it. It wouldn't be flexible. It would take a long time to break in. And Jordan was known for wanting a brand new pair of shoes on every game he played, but he didn't, also didn't want to break them in. So the way that they got around this was to adding a canvas upper. And the cool thing is this isn't just a regular white canvas. This is a ballistic nylon canvas. It's also called Cordura. And the benefits of this is it allows you to have that flexibility of canvas, but a lot more of the tensile strength and a lot more um, abrasion resistance than most leather. Does, do you actually need abrasion resistance for, for basketball? Probably not, but it is less stretch resistant and more strong than a regular canvas. And so if we compare it to a regular canvas, we took the macro lens and did a really close up shot just so you can see that it really is a canvas pattern. It looks like almost identical, but the actual fibers themselves are a much higher quality fiber. But the thing is, that's just what everyone says. We don't actually know if it's true. So we wanted to run a abrasion resistance test and a puncture test to see how true those actually are. So we started with the abrasion test first and we compared it to a regular sneaker leather, a regular canvas around the same thickness to the ballistic nylon. It's not quite as abrasion resistant as leather. And I think that's because that nail can just sneak between the different fibers and more separate the canvas than it actually does puncture it. And as you can see, it is more puncture resistant than regular canvas. So it was a really smart material to use for this shoe because it has that flexibility and the durability, and it still allowed this shoe to have that patent leather that's not gonna stretch as much and give you a little bit more durability. And there is a little extra bit of leather on the back here that that we also ran a couple of tests on. We burned it and you could see it doesn't have that heavy plastic coating like a C grade leather, it's more like a B grade. It's about 1.5 millimeters thick, so average Nike leather, and it does have just a little bit of that grain pattern that's at the top of the cross section that gives uh, the leather a lot of its strength and its smooth surface. So I would consider that a B grade leather. And one issue about canvas that a lot of people don't consider is because of how thick the weave is and how much it absorbs water and other things, it's very prone to, to staining. So we had to do a couple tests on it just to see how much it actually absorbs stain. Because even just wearing these around, you can already see that it's grabbed a lot of dirt because it's a white canvas. So we ran a quick test. And as you can see, it definitely does grab a lot of the 
stuff that you might encounter at a weekend barbecue. But also at the same time, you can see how easily it is to, how easy the patent leather is to wipe off and be completely clean. Right off the bat, I just love the fact that these two contrasting materials serve two different purposes and have two completely different attributes that are combined on this shoe to make it perform as well as it did. And I, I really love that but, that, but to me, that's not even the most interesting part. The most interesting thing is this carbon fiber plate on the bottom. They put this in the shoe to add a little bit more rigidity, a little bit more spring when you're jumping because it springs back into place rather than like a soft foam and rubber does. And it adds a little bit more durability and torsional flex prevention for, for playing basketball. And more importantly, they added all these features without adding hardly any weight to it because usually you do this with a metal shank or whatever, but because they use carbon fiber that has hardly any weight to it, you're still able to play basketball in it with all those added benefits. But the one question I have with this shoe is carbon fiber, though it is strong, there's different qualities of carbon fiber and some of it is pretty easy to crack and snap. So we wanted to do a quick little snap test because I don't think anyone's ever done this with their Jordans just to see how easy or hard it was to actually snap that carbon fiber. As you can see, it actually snaps pretty easily. Will you be doing this movement as much and as hard when you're playing basketball? Not really, but also kind of, you know, like if you're, if you're playing basketball on this, you're going to be bending your shoe like this. And so I'm curious if you guys have, if that have a pair of these, is your carbon fiber cracked or is it just, we cracked it because we're putting it up to like non-basketball standards by just literally cracking it like this. So that's the preliminary information. Let's get this thing cut in half and see what the real guts of this thing look like, because that's a lot of times where the real crux of these shoes is. So let's cut them in half. All right, we got them cut in half, so let's see what's inside. So now you can really see how thick that carbon fiber is. It is actually a little bit thicker than I expected. And it still cracks pretty easily, but at least it's not just like a, a faux carbon fiber layer or like a, just a really thin carbon fiber layer that's just strictly there for looks. I think that's thick enough to actually give you some of that spring and give you some extra durability. It's just a bummer it cracks so easily. You can also now see that full length air unit and it's fortunately for this shoe, it's not a repurposed Monarch air unit like we've seen before. It's actually a, a full length air unit designed for this shoe. And it's, it's kind of interesting too because it's a fairly thin air unit compared to some of the other ones we've seen. And Jordan, like we've said in previous videos, he didn't like having a really thick midsole because he couldn't feel the, the, the court underneath of him. And so it makes sense that over time they slowly just drop that height of that air unit down a little bit more at a time, same with the foam, to where now you've got just enough foam to give you a little bit of impact resistance while still allowing enough room for an air unit just to fit in there to give you whatever air units actually do. And one thing that I was really hoping for that really would have sold me on the shoe is I was hoping this ballistic nylon wrapped all the way underneath and was strobel stitched together. But as you can see, that ballistic nylon stops where the leather begins. It's not that big of a deal. So overall, what do I think of the shoe? I really grew to love the shoe more and more as we found out more about the details and the durability, the materials, the concept behind the shoe. And then the other question is, do these materials actually add some value to the, the performance of the sneaker? I still think they do, even though it's not up to its fullest potential. I think that patent leather still adds a little bit of rigidity and anti-stretch. The ballistic nylon still durable and allows it to flex. The carbon fiber shank, I still think gives you some, some spring. So I still think it all works. It's just not as good as it could be but it shouldn't necessarily detract from what you think of the shoe because at the end of the day, it is still a mass produced Nike sneaker. It retailed for 220, but if it was $350 and it had everything dialed in, this might be my favorite shoe we ever cut apart, especially out of the sneakers. 
And the, the thing that I really appreciate the shoe more than anything is they've perfectly balanced what I love about shoes. They chose these, these really interesting materials and made them work functionally, but more importantly, still main, maintain the aesthetic of the shoe to make it one of the most popular, most sought after, and most beloved Jordans of all time. And so now I'm converted. Big fan of the Jordan 11s, I get it now. So let me know what you guys think and what you thought of the Jordan 11s and if you've had the carbon fiber splitting because I can't imagine it's not gonna split if you actually played ball in these. But let me know and thanks so much for everything you guys do. Your support is what allows us to buy these shoes and really dissect them and, and start answering some of the long held questions and debates that have gone unanswered. And more importantly, to show you what you're really spending your hard earned money on. So thank you guys for everything, see ya.